I'm so sad. I can't go fishing. That was it. And, like, we'd all be, like, uh, on the harbor, like, all these boats not going out. Sad fisherman's picture for, like, a week because there was no oil. So I was like, how do I, how do I get that? How do I do that? How do, what do you do? And um, I ended up uh, meeting some, some Coast Guard uh, soldiers, I, sailors, um, and I ended up, you know, getting this little boat, and the, the, the gulf is pretty shallow in many points, and I uh, was like, how do I take an image that looks different than what everyone else is doing? Well, I just decided, you know, I was going to jump in the water and shoot straight down into the oil. Uh, and really kind of go with like more of an Irving Penn, Rod and Pepper approach to create something beautiful out of something horrible. And this is where I think the power of photography lies. Like, being from uh, New York, in the winter, people walk their dogs. And a uh, dog's going to take a big shit. It happens. But in the winter, there's like steam that comes off of it. And it might be early morning, so you have some nice dawn light coming down, and there's this big pile of poop and some really nice smoke coming off of it. And maybe it's creating a shimmer a prism of a rainbow, and you could very quickly take a picture. Very quickly. No painter is going to spend three months making an oil painting of smoke coming off dog shit. No sculptor is going to make a bronze to really capture the essence of that. But photography, you can do that in an instant. You can make something horrible beautiful. And this is what I aim to do. I wanted people to hang up and look at pictures of this beautiful oil that was going to destroy our world. Like, I wanted it to be so pretty that they couldn't ignore it. And then say, oh, that is not a pepperoni pizza. That is my beach. And actually, it, 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 it was, I was happy with the outcome. I, um, because I jumped into the water, uh, they wouldn't let me back on shore until our boat and every surface that had oil w was clean. And basically, Blue Dawn, which is like a dishwashing material, is the only substance known on the planet to remove oil from organic surfaces. And all of it had across America had been bought to like protect the birds and to clean up, you know, people if they got oil in them. And they wouldn't let my little boat back into the harbor with oil on it. So I had to like jump off the boat and clean it and, and then we get back in the boat and this Coast Guard uh, officer looks down at me. He's like, y you can't come back into the harbor. I was like, why not? She's like, you have oil all over your legs. I was like, but I, I have no more, I have no more Blue Dawn. She, and I, she disappears for a second. She comes back, she throws something onto my boat and I look down and it's a razor. She said, start shaving. And so I, under the watchful gaze of an entire Coast Guard crew in my little dinghy boat, I start shaving my legs. I told everyone I was a cyclist when I came back. Uh, and so this brings me, I know what everyone's waiting for, the iPhone stuff. Uh, how do I get into it? Um, I, I, so this is like, this is iPhone number one, and this is in uh, 2008. Uh, this is actually my wife's breakfast. She was pregnant with our first child, and we went to a restaurant, and she literally ordered everything on the menu. I've never seen that before. She's like a four foot ten small woman. She's tiny. And she's like 85 pounds, and she ordered everything. And I was like, I have to photograph this. So there's my first foodie picture. I ended up just like, I, I, this, is like this is all the first iPhone, 2008. I was, I was taking pictures of weird things that I saw. I'm playing with it. I had no idea where it would lead. Uh, it was just an idea of something to play with. It was that thing in my back pocket. And uh, what was really great about the iPhone was like when you start in photography and you like take your first class I'll give you the class, okay? Take it. And you first get introduced to photography. You're like, I'm going to carry my camera with me everywhere. 
When I go shopping to the grocery store, there's going to be a little old lady. She's going to be feeling up some fruit. And I'm going to have my camera with me, and I'm going to take a picture of it. And then you become a professional photographer. You have to archive your pictures. You have to put the metadata in, the captions, and download, and send them to the cloud, and send them to your backup hard drive, and give them to your agency. And, you know. and then the idea of going grocery shopping and photographing this little old woman is like, well, fuck that. I'm not doing that. I'm leaving my camera at home. And so as you progress in your photo career, you'd be like, I will pick up my camera when I need to because it's no longer my hobby. It's my vocation. It's my job. And so I wouldn't take my camera with me when I go grocery shopping. But your iPhone or your smart camera, whatever, it's in your back pocket. It's there already. And it was really easy to just reach back and grab it. I actually call uh, you know, these smartphones with cameras darkroom in your pants. Uh, it's copyrighted, by the way. No one can make T-shirts out of that. It's mine. And, and I just ended up photographing everything I saw if I didn't have my camera with me. And actually, mo some days I specifically went out just with uh, the phone, and I started this blog. And um, it was really amazing, I think, the idea that you can communicate. You can take pictures and send pictures on. I, I, I started a, a Tumblr blog before Instagram was even invented. And it was just this idea that you could talk to people, that you could show them the pictures. This was my visual journey. This was my diary of, of like just weird things that I saw over the course of my day. And I, I, I run. So whenever I'm in another city, I, I go jogging. And like I'll always have my phone on me because I'm listening to music. And if I see something weird, this is Santa Monica in California. I was on assignment. I was just like, oh, that's a picture. I'd like stop running and take a picture. Again, it's just like it's the camera that you have on you. Um, but the interconnectivity part is where it's most successful. The idea that you could uh, take pictures and post them online and have an audience immediately um, and tell a story. So this was the first time I used the iPhone professionally. I had an assignment from a client. They're like, Ben, we, we want you to do this. We really want you to do it with a Hasselblad X-Pan and chrome film. And I'm like, if, excuse me, what? I've been shooting digital for like 10 years. Like, you slide, slide film? They still make that? It's like, where do I get an X-Pan? And, and they're like, yeah, we, we just love the idea of you shooting this with Fuji Previa because it'll look so green. I'm like, what are you talking about? Can't I do that in post? I have, and so I'm very confused. I don't know what to do. I don't even remember if you're supposed to underexpose Chrome or overexpose it by a third of a stop. I'm like racking my brain. This is where a class would have probably helped. Um, and <laughs> so my friend was like, Ben, Ben, have you seen this new application called Hipstamatic on the iPhone? It makes it look like you took pictures in 1965. They'll never know. <laughs> it's like, perfect. And this was back when iPhone photo apps could like take one picture every 30 seconds. So I'd be ready. And just wait for it. I was like, oh, this is like a digital Holga. This is perfect. I have no idea what I'm getting. Now, the story was even more interesting. There's an area called Yerevan in Colorado where 15% of the yellow cake for the Manhattan Project came from, for an atomic bomb. But this area is so radioactive that the U.S. government has decided to bury it for all time. That's fine. It is really radioactive. I wore like a little thing on me to make sure that I could still have children. And uh, the thing is, though, that they're like, well, in 10,000 years, which is like the half-life of uranium, uh, you know, we might not be around. But aliens might visit the planet Earth. So I love this about uh, Americans. They used one billion, with a B, billion dollars of U.S. taxpayer money to create a mathematical-based language that you can only see from outer space out of granite on top of where they buried this town so that in 10,000 years, aliens will know 
that this space is radioactive. It's like this genius. Um, and so they want me to shoot this with panoramic. I was like, can I go into space to shoot this thing? I'd be the first photographer in space. They had nixed that idea. Too much expenses, I guess. Um, so I, I'm shooting with the X-Pan, and I actually took my 5D also with me just to like make sure I was exposing correctly. And then I have the iPhone, and I'm like taking these pictures. And when I get back to, and this is the, this is the mathematical symbol. This is like the big granite thing. You can only fully see it from outer space. Right now, like my third testicle is growing because it's so radioactive. Ladies, if you're interested. Um, and I usually get more laughs with that one, but <laughs> whatever. It's late, fine, get it. And um, so I get back to New York, and like the film, I send the film to get processed. I remember that I needed to do that. And uh, I like made little 8x10 prints on my like Epson printer at home. And I bring them to the client. And they're like, these are amazing. What did you shoot this with? A Polaroid? This is so great. And I was like, my camera, phone. I shot it with my phone. Uh, let's go to lunch. Like change the subject. Um, and they're like, no, these are amazing. This is this whole abandoned town. Everyone has to leave. And uh, they're like, no, no, really. Uh, what did you shoot this with? I was like, my phone. It's like, oh, we can't. We can't publish that. That's not a real. That's not a real camera. That's not. Yeah, we can't do that. This is a woman who decided to stay. Um, she has a garden that's filled with yellow cake. These are her potting stones around like her plants. That is actually a piece of like yellow cake. Like you can blow shit up with that. Um, and uh, but they wouldn't publish it. And this was back when I was starting to do a lot more with with the iPhone. And I would I would actually get hate mail, emails from other photographers, be like, "You should not be using an iPhone to take pictures. Not a real camera. I just spent five thousand dollars on equipment, and this is totally inappropriate. You call yourself a photographer. You are a disgrace." It's like, all right, that was harsh. Cry cry myself to sleep on my iPhone. So um, I was like, how can I take this to the next level? And um, uh, after all these bomb blasts and I was really injured in Iraq, um, I ended up doing a lot more work in Afghanistan where I only spent time with civilians. Like I never, in like the five years that I worked in Afghanistan, uh, I was never in any kind of violent situations. I was, it was just like I had the most awesome time. I, I did a story on like the heroin stuff. It wasn't really dangerous. And then I was like with bodybuilders because it was crazy there. And I, d I did all these like skiing over uh, minefields. It was cross-country skiing over a minefield. It was amazing. Um, so I would walk around. I spent a lot of time walking around. I had a house that I rented with some friends and I would just, you know, walk around. Um, and of course, the whole Jason Bourne thing, James Bond, CIA agent thing still didn't work out for me. So I kind of like left my bigger cameras at home. and was just walking around with the iPhone trying to blend. You know, I grew my beard out. I had brown contact lenses. I kind of, you know, covered my tattoos. This was lunch. This is actually the menu. Catch it if you can. Do you see it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good deal. It's a good, good deal. Good deal. The, the family meal was 1.5 liters of cock. It was, um, very tasty. Very tasty. So this is my second food picture. And so I'm, I'm still posting these images. This is my cat photo. Everyone needs to have a cat photo. You do know this horrible statistic that like Caltech and MIT did this joint program where they created uh, like a neural network uh, or supercomputers in the shape of a neural network and sent it out to look at every page on the internet and to come back collating information of like what it found. And it found that there are more pictures of cats on the internet than anything else in the history of mankind. This disturbs me immensely. I, I, I mean, I'm a dog person in general, but still, but this is my cat picture. But I found that like using the iPhone on the street allowed me to get a different kind of image than I was able to get if I was working with. So uh, there are two Western supermarkets in Kabul. 
And sometimes, like, I'll be, I'll be there for, like, three months, and I'll be like, I need some American food. I need, like, some chocolate breakfast cereal, like some Captain Crunch, something, like, super sweet that no one in Afghanistan eats except fat Americans. And so I was like, I will go to the Western store to buy them, uh, where they're, like, you know, five months old and cost $20. And um, I wish I could have been at this meeting where... I'm just going to imitate what I think happened. Were there a bunch of like Afghan owners of, of this store? Be like, we really need to get more people to come in. What should we do? They're like, well, I think maybe if we make a giant picture of a woman's face and put it on top of the supermarket and then make everyone walk into her mouth to go into the store, this would uh, attract more clientele. To our, to our supermarket. And I could see the guys at the table like, yes, this is a great idea. We all have to go into a woman's mouth. This is perfect. Let's do this. And this goes up. So this is the entrance to the supermarket. And I'm like, oh, this is so peculiar. And I take a picture. And I go, I put it on my blog. I say, entrance to supermarket. Now, I went to school with a lot of like, uh, in, my, in my class, there were only like three dudes and about 16 women. And they were like really into Cindy Sherman, like heavy feminist photographers. And they, they followed my blog. We're all friends. And they were like commenting, oh, this is just, this is wrong. This is objectifying the female form. This is, this is wrong. It was like a delicate thing. They were like, this is just wrong. This, you should tell these Afghan people that this is just wrong. And then, of course, I had all my Taliban contacts from when I did the drug story. And they were like, this is wrong. Uh, we're going to bomb you. And I feel like this was the first time I brought feminists and the Taliban together to agree <laughs> on something. I'm making peace. Right here. This was down the next day. And I, know, I don't think it was me who did it. I think people just saw this. like, this is so bad to have in Afghanistan on a soup. Like, we just should not walk into women's mouths. Like, it's just a bad idea. Um, so then I, I, I was like, okay, so I want to take this to the next level. So this social media thing, is, it's interesting. Because you can shoot, you can post, you can do it all together. It's very cool. Uh, so I went to Libya. Uh, and I was actually still, I had an assignment, so I was still shooting with a traditional 35 millimeter camera and also using my iPhone. Just to give you a sense of, uh, you know, the, the iPhone and then, you know, with my Canon. Um, but what I ended up doing was creating, basically, I was working for GQ, and they print, you know, they, they, they weren't going to publish for like four months. You know, they take a while to publish. And so what I was doing, I, this whole idea was like, listen, guys, I can create a teaser campaign for the article by using my iPhone and using my feed. Because at the time, my feed was like bigger than most magazines' feeds. Because I had been on Tumblr and Instagram before anyone else. So I was like, guys, people follow me. Why don't I just say, go look at GQ in four months. And I'll just use these as like a teaser. And they're like, oh, we like that idea. Um, of course, when a bomb blast goes off, and I'm actually being blown backwards by a tank that's exploding, I couldn't pick up my cameras fast enough. I just had my phone in my hand, and I was able to make I mean, in terms of technical capability, in case anyone's wondering, this is the iPhone 3, which is, like, it's a way ago. That's a shell casing flying in the air, that guy's AK-47. It was good enough. And people are kind of asking me, like, why was I standing in front of the gun? And here's a cool thing, not cool thing, but like, you know, again, after much experience of being in war zones, you realize that like an AK-47 has the range, if you're amazing and in an action movie, of about 500 yards. And this is if you're cleaning the gun every night and oiling it and, ma and zeroing it at 500 yards, maximum awesomeness, right? These guys, between this trench and Qaddafi's forces, kilometer and a half away. No one is fucking hitting anybody. <laughs> They're just shooting, and I don't know where it's going. And all the photographers be like, this is awesome, guys. <laughs> Hi. I mean, just to give you an idea how moronic all this was, first of all, 
this guy is missing the sleeve from his body armor because he's wearing it on his head. He's smoking a cigarette and just decides to duck at the last minute. This guy's wearing a fez. And I don't even know what gun that was. It's like a World War I. And this is like the next instance. So this is the guy who was smoking the cigarette. As I turned around and put my camera down and picked up my iPhone, uh, an artillery round landed next to us and blew up. And it was actually most of the shock and the shrapnel was absorbed by the desert sand. Who not to stand next to in war zones? This is, again, one of these things that, you know, you learn from experience that this is called war fashion. You do not, when the shit hits the fan and this guy's like, I need to use this, you don't want to be standing next to him because he has to take out a little hammer, tiny hammer that they use on your knees when you go to the doctor, and basically turn all those rounds back in the same direction. So when there's no ammunition left and he's like, I got to use it, hold on, everybody. You don't want to be standing next to that guy. The next day, he was actually wearing grenades in his lapels. It's like, this is not the best place to be. And of course, like, I, I was working for Al Jazeera in the beginning of, of uh, I was doing Al Jazeera NGQ, and uh, Al Jazeera decided that they wanted to be, like, the first organization in Libya to, like, live stream the war. So they basically had a car every kilometer satellite dish that would bounce a signal back. And their cameraman, who I would run into the trenches with, was this like crusty old British guy who was like on his third marriage and all his kids hated him. He was like this old school, you know, drinks every night videographer. And he's like, you know what we should do? We, I don't know why I give him a, Brit a Brooklyn accent, but he's like, we should put a dongle in the satellite dish and Wi-Fi uh, the battle trenches. So all the trenches in the front lines had a Wi-Fi signal. So I'm like, you know, going online on my iPhone and like tweeting as the bullets are flying over our, our heads. But then like, you know, when it comes to social media, I am super careful about posting things that are too gratuitous. Because I know like I've photographed Justin Bieber and stupid people like that and I have, I, no, I, I have and Actually, my niece had asked me, my niece who's like, you know, 10, was like, what does this hair smell like? I was like, I don't know, I didn't smell, but, but like, I have teeny boppers that also follow me on Instagram, and like, you know, if one parent complains, you can lose your account. So I'm like really careful about putting too much gratuitous violence on, uh, you know, on social media. Um, I'll skip this one pretty quickly, because it's really graphic. But, you know, there's the only time where I put down my, my iPhone. I was like, I have to capture this with, you know, camera. And I stood there and I just waited and watched blood flowing down the stairs. It's, I almost, uh, like, lost my marriage over that picture. Like, it, long story. I won't get into it. But my wife was not happy that I came so close to, to being shot by a sniper. This is actually... After I ran out of this building, uh, the, after the fall of trip, I'm running after that guy was shot, and a grenade went off. And this th this is overexposed because a grenade is exploding, and this rebel took the brunt of the explosion. And the guy standing next to me has his AK-47 up, which is right here, and he just fired off 30 rounds. He was so surprised that he just he had his it was on full auto, and he depressed the trigger and filed all 30 rounds off and, and, and the, the muzzle was just a red hot ember. And after the grenade went off, he slapped it into my arm by accident and I ended up having like a, like a little burn mark of an AK-47 on the front of my arm for about a year before it went away. Um, where I think, you know, it's going, like this is Omar. And I, like, I, he was my driver. And he's also, he, he's a very robust man. He's a, he's a chef. He worked with Anthony Bourdain, uh, you know, took him around Libya. He's, he's, he's really an amazing character, and he was my driver for about two months. We got along really well. He's my Facebook friend. He sends my kids birthday presents all the time. He's still in Libya. And um, we had this bullet hole in the front of our car window the entire time I was with him. I'm like, I know I'm, you know, at, at first you're like, oh, it's a bullet hole. I can compose with this. I'm taking pictures all the time of you know, bullet holes in the window. I mean, it's classic, right? And then after like three weeks of doing this, you're like, okay, can we get a windshield fixed? Like, 
I know I'm paying you enough. But this is getting old, the whole bullet hole thing. He's like, well, Ben, I, I can't change it. I was like, why? He's like, listen, there's a story behind this. During the war, uh, you know, a sniper fired at me, and he missed, and it went through my windshield, and I got out of the car, and I killed him. And I hate that I had to kill another human being. Like, I hate it. I was sick. It, I was vomiting. I never wanted to kill someone in my entire life. And so I leave this hole, this bullet hole here as a reminder, like, that I killed someone. Just for me, as a reminder. And I was like, that is incredibly powerful. And I, I wasn't going to get, like, a writer that I was working with to, like, write an article about Omar. But I was able to just write two paragraphs about him and put that on Instagram, put that on Tumblr, and have this image. And I was, like, really kind of trying to experiment to see if, like, people would read that. This is another man. This is in Misrata. So I went back to Misrata to lay candles uh, with Ron Haviv in the space where Tim Hetherington and Chris Hondras were killed. And I, you know, I, I, go, I like going to barber shops wherever I go and get my head shaved. And I was getting my head shaved when this man walked in and I asked him, what, what happened to you? He's like, well, you know, uh, artillery during the war took my leg and my arm and parts of my hand and killed my mother, my sister, my niece, and my nephew, and I can only hope that all of it was for a reason, that there will be peace one day, because otherwise I just, I can't imagine that this was just for no good reason. And again, it was just like a simple caption that I was able to put down, that no one was going to write an article about what he suffered through, but I was able to just encapsulate his story in one image on, on social media. He uh, is not angry at me. He spit on me by accident while he was yelling and, and it got on my head and he was like, oh, sorry, and he wiped it off with the gun. Just kind of, sorry about that. I was like, all right, that's great. And this is, um, I'll try and breeze through this because I know I'm, I'm taking up too much. We're good? All right, I'll keep you here for another two hours. Um, so I was in California with my wife. She's a filmmaker and she had a movie premiering at a film festival in, in uh, near San Francisco, when I got a call from Time Magazine, they're like, there's a big storm coming to New York. It's like, oh, oh, really? I should probably get home. Uh, and they're like, yeah, we'd love for you to photograph it uh, with your iPhone, and we will give you uh, the keys to the kingdom. You will have the ability to edit your own pictures on time.com, on Time's Instagram. You're in control. Really? It's like, no editor involved. There's like, you can do whatever you want. It's me, it's Michael Brown, it's Ed Cashy. There were five of us, and they were like, each of you get a borough of New York, and we want you to document the storm, and the rest of us are just not going to bother you. I was like, this is amazing. This is how photography should be. No editors. Um, and uh, I didn't say that, did I? Um, and so I, I, I got this last flight back to New York, and my mom was watching our kids, and I like, get a bunch of batteries and some like canned soup, and I like set the kids up, and my mom, and my wife stayed in California, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go document the storm. And I, I go out to Coney Island, because that's where, like, these big waves were coming in. And there was, like, a whole line of photographers with, like, 300-millimeter lenses covered in saran wrap and, you know, the big waterproof hoods, and they're wearing, you know, gators and... and, and just rain jackets, and I'm like in swim shorts, <laughs> and I put my phone in a Ziploc bag. I said, hi guys, <laughs> and I, I ran into the water. I'm like, so I am now in everyone's shot. I'm like, sorry, but I have a small, it doesn't have a zoom. It's a it's wide angle, there's nothing I can do. And um, there are a couple of really funny pictures of me. I look like an idiot. And there were two guys. There was one, there was a Hasidic Jew who was dancing in the water. And then there was this guy who was an illegal uh, Mexican who had just come over the border into America. And he was like, never seen a hurricane, never seen the Atlantic Ocean. And I was like, I don't know which one. It's like a loaded thing. I c couldn't figure out. Uh, actually, time ended up choosing this one. And this was like uh, the first iPhone image that was on the cover of uh, a major publication. Um, and so like I ended up you know, continuing this project of documenting Hurricane Sandy with, um, I wonder if Cartier-Bresson would be rolling over in his grave. 
I'm not sure. I think maybe he would have been into the eye. One of the things I hate seeing is like one of the things that's so hard is that sometimes we act like vultures. Like if there's a big news story and someone's dead and there's like one of their loved ones or, you know, their, their relatives are crying. Like if you're a wire photographer and you're on deadline, you're being pressured to like make that image, you'll just be like, you know, and just get in someone's face. And it, like when you think about it, we're like, that is horrible what we do sometimes as photographers. Just like, just totally don't care about other people's feelings. Like we swallow our shame and we just like, oh, we're just going to take pictures of you because you're, you're crying. And um, one of the things I found about like I could continue a conversation with someone and look them in the eye and still take pictures with my iPhone. And it was something like I didn't feel as a shame doing that. I didn't feel like I was taking advantage of people in the midst of what they were going. He was, it was really funny. He, he's actually, he's Indian, which I think is actually now funny that I think about it. He's a newlywed, and they had just moved into their house in Staten Island, and he was cleaning up, and um, he's like, this is crazy. I was like, what is it? He's like, I have an entirely new DVD collection. All my DVDs got washed out, and someone else's got washed into the house. And I was like, maybe it's just your wife's DVD collection and she threw yours out. Um, this was, again, this became another magazine cover. Um, this is the, uh, the Jetstar roller coaster as it fell off a big pier in, in New Jersey. Um, this is where being a war photographer really helped. The, it, this whole area was full of like leaking uh, natural gas that uh, so they closed it down like no one could go in there if you lit a cigarette uh, you know the whole place would explode so everyone was like really careful and I sat there for like a day with one police officer who was guarding a bridge I could see I could like see the the roller coaster and I just needed to get in a little further and he's like no you can't go it's like well uh, let's do some chewing tobacco which is disgusting but all soldiers and police officers in the states do chewing tobacco because when you're on duty you're not allowed to smoke so I'm sitting there doing chewing tobacco, and we're talking about body armor and bullets and the war. And I'm just like, I know all this stuff, so I'm like schmoozing with him. Just be like, yeah, that's a crazy gun. Could really kill someone with that. You know, and finally it's like, okay, you're cool. I'll take you in. And he gave me like 30 seconds to make this, to make this image. There's a really nice park here now. French tourists who decided to still come to Manhattan. Uh, after Hurricane Sandy. So this is below 23rd Street in Manhattan. There's no electricity. I have never seen anything like this in my entire life. I actually went on a bicycle ride. I, went, I lived in Brooklyn, and I rode over the Brooklyn Bridge into Manhattan with like lights on my head, like camping lights. And like, it was like completely empty Manhattan, no lights. It was like something out of like an apocalyptic movie with Will Smith. Like it was just, it was crazy. Um, he was actually... This is hilarious. Uh, so I see this guy crying. I'm like, is everything okay? He's like, yeah, I'm just from the cold. I'm not really crying. But this is, I'm so upset. I'm like, what? Did you lose your house? What's going on? He's like, no. Listen, my name is John Lennon. And not one day goes by of electricity being restored. Then I'm getting phone calls from kids asking me where Ringo is. So um, that was, that's my iPhone work. So um, the one thing I would do, I, I have a couple of extra images in, in this um, slideshow. More is something for students than anything else. Um, like I did war forever and I got blown up so many times. Like I lost all the nerves on the right side of my body. My hips have been replaced. You know, uh, my leg almost got blown off. My funny bone is now in the front of my arm and on the back. They moved it. Like, I, I, you know, tremendous injuries where I was like, well, maybe it's time for me to, like, find other venues to shoot. And at this point in my career, I am becoming sort of a jack of all trades. I do a ton of sports. I do a ton of fighting sports because that's sort of my PTSD talking to me. But, like, there's, that's not fighting, but that is sports. And, but, like, I have ended up covering the gambit of documenting you know, now I have this big project and I'm fighting around the world. And there's no, I, I, you know, I don't think we need to be shoehorned into doing one genre of photography. 
There's, there was at a time where it'd be like, you have to be a war photographer, you have to be a fashion photographer, you have to be a wildlife photographer. And I don't think that's true. I think photography, in many ways, this is wildlife and sports, in, in many ways can, um, is all about experiencing the world around you. And I don't want to limit myself anymore. I don't want to just say, I want to see like death and destruction. And this is uh, oil wrestling in Turkey. So that's why I'm, I'm like also going to be doing kushti while I'm here. Slightly homoerotic, a little bit with that one. Oh, yeah. The only way to win is to really stick your hand down your opponent's pants and flip them because they're all covered in oil. Uh, I did the Olympics because now I'm like, I'm on a roll with sports. So like, I, I, I feel like you, you know, my whole idea is like, I'm going to shoot sports, but I'm going to do it differently than what other people are doing. And that's the whole thing. That's like the future of your career in photography is like, don't do what I've done. Don't do what someone else has done. Like Steve McCurry, I love him. He's like, I love his compositions, but like, I'm not going to shoot that because he's done that. So like, find some way to, like, I am now, like, I have a contract with ESPN, and I get to do all the sports I want to do in black and white in my own way because sports has been done before, so I want to find a way to do it differently. And, and you can. You can take all these lessons that you learned, and you don't have to just put them just in one thing. That is not an alien coming to get him. Everyone asked me how I, how I did that, and I was actually, I was, like, basically just sweating all over my camera. I was like, I was, I saw all these, uh, and this is a good thing, like, basically, if you're in an event where there's 20 photographers, go someplace else where there's not 20. Like, if they're all here, stand somewhere else. Like, I went to the ski jump, and there are all these photographers there, so I went underneath the lip of the jump, and all I got was, like, asses floating away from me into space. And that was not a good picture. But then when I went to the aerials, I see all these photographers here. I was like, I'm going to try something else. I had a little ice pick. I climb up the side. I'm like schwitzing. I'm like really sweating, like just trying to climb up the side of this mountain. And it's getting all over my cameras. My cameras fall in the snow. There's like ice on it. I'm like wiping it off. And it caused all these weird streaks with the light, which ended up how those, those images were made. But like no one else was at that angle where I was standing, mostly because I was about to fall off the mountain. You know, now I, I just started getting assignments for um, wildlife photography. So this is kind of the last landmass near Antarctica. I had to track pumas for two weeks, um, which was a lot of fun. So, I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's for me right now, it's like great to diversify and do as much as possible because I just want to, I want to, I want to see the world. And like the same thrill in a way of being in all these places the same, of experiencing all these things. It's just like being on the front line of life. And it doesn't have to be war. But I'll tell you what, when she started looking at me like that, my heart went a little pitter-patter. And, you know, I felt alive for about three seconds. And then she ate me. Guys, thank you so much. I appreciate it. If anyone has any questions... I will answer questions. I feel like you probably shouldn't have any because I've really bared my soul to you. No, no. You know, really, it, 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 here's the thing. I, I, it's, it's such a, a polarizing thing. It's just another tool in the camera bag. It's just one more thing you could use. You don't have to use it. You might. Today, I was out. We were walking around. And I had my camera that I didn't charge the batteries for. And in the middle of the day, uh, I had no more camera batteries. So I pulled out my phone and used that for the rest of the day. You know, when I'm out with my kids, uh, that's what I have. You know, uh, sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. You know, it just depends on the situation. It's an amazing tool. Now we have, you know, we have mirrorless cameras. And almost all cameras are Wi-Fi enabled, so you can send the pictures that you make to your phones and you know and then send it straight to social media it's just it's just one more tool that we can use and they all have a place i you know sometimes i walk around in a lot of weird places like where i think sometimes using a camera would distract from getting kind of the intimate photographs that i want to make like the new york city subway i don't want to use a big digital camera when i shoot there 
But, you know, if I have my small little iPhone, I could take pictures. And then, or like when I got, I have the new iPhone 6S, and Apple gave me that because I've done other things for them. And so I went to go shoot with it uh, in New York City before it was released. And people like were like, what is that? I'm like, oh, I'm just shooting with this new phone. And then they're like, yeah, you can take a picture of me. And so I'm like, you know, it was, it's just a way in. And, and so, I, you know, I think it's just one more tool that we could use. Like, I'm not going to take a picture of, of this Puma here with my iPhone. It's just not, you know, that's with a 400 millimeter lens, like, or whatever. But, you know, it's, I'm not, right? So it just, it, it, you find the right use for it. But I think it is an efficient tool that we shouldn't disregard just because it's not a traditional camera. I don't think the camera itself is a big deal. I don't, I, oh, I'm sorry. I s was asking Ben if he believes that the issue is the phone itself or the fact that people are using filters in journalism. Because I, I, I don't think the yeah, phone no, itself I is an issue anymore. Right? I think three years ago that was the issue. I think now it's not an issue anymore. I think filters are now more of an issue in general with uh, the the sophistication and the, and the visual vocabulary that people have. We are now seeing the world in like a super saturated, contrasty way. Everyone is toning their pictures and like reds are red and greens are green. Like nothing's flat anymore. And, and I think that is probably what's harming overall in a sense because, w you know, we're going to look out at the world and it's not going to look that you know that crazy color it's like you know we all have these like you know crazy TVs now that have like it, I mean like what like the new Canon is 50 megapixel there was a test about what the human eye can see and we're the equivalent of seven megapixels mm. so like why do we need all the rest of this like we don't necessarily you know 256 million colors is like that's a lot of colors I have answers. I'll just start answering random things. <laughs> yeah. Like, yes. Come on, you got Ben Lowy here. Someone has to have a question. Please. Your stories, uh, the oil spill story, or even being in Iraq, you know, uh, we, we clearly see a very different way of storytelling. Totally, telling. totally. Yeah. So classic newspaper storytelling. I, I, I think there's, there's a photo essay and a photo story. Yes. And like the photo essay is point A to point B. But, uh, you know, and then there's the photo essay, which is, like, more thematic, more emotional. This is not, it's not set in time. It's, it's more of an idea. So how can you photograph this room? How can everyone who's sitting in this room right now photograph this room in an entirely unique way? And we have so many tools that you can do this. You can overexpose. You can underexpose. You can lie down on the floor. You can climb a wall. You can shoot through a bottle. You can spit on your camera lens. You can, there's so many different, you can look for a reflection. You can change the angle of your height. Even that, like, as a tall person, I am always looking down at people. And so, like, just doing this, like, I change the perspective. And there, I am sure that we, could f we can make a photo essay where every one of us takes one picture and shows this room in a completely different way. So, like, tomorrow when we go on the photo walk, I, we're going to be on a street, and I want everyone to photograph a street in a completely different way than what you normally would do. And the whole idea is, you know, I use my mother, like that's my like catch-all, but it could be anything. It's like, how do I show my mom <laughs> an Indian street? But how can I show it to her in a way that she doesn't already think about? Like, there, she already has a preconceived idea of what a street in India might look like. Because she's seen Steve McCurry's pictures, or she's watched a movie, or whatever. How can I make an image? And I say this specifically, it's make an image. It's not taking an image. Taking an image means you just, you don't think about it. You run outside and you just press the shutter button. Car accident happens right outside. You take you and you go take. Making an image is you are seeing the space and you are moving around it and you're using your brain to compose, to control all the elements and to create an image that encompasses that space. That's what you need to do. Everything has been done already, 100%.
But not everything has been done by you. I haven't seen everything yet. I haven't been to this city before. So any pictures that I made, they might have been made before, but they weren't made by me. And every experience that you've had in your life contributes to the one moment you press that shutter, that tells you to press that shutter right at that second. And that's going to be unique to who you are. And you just have to find the right way to look at it. And that just takes doing it over and over again. Like a gazillion times. Like I, I photograph every single day. I force myself to photograph every single day. Even if I am at home editing in my underwear, which happens a lot, I find a way. It's like when my kids take a shower, I'm like photographing them doing silly things in the bathtub. Because I want to photograph them doing silly things in a bathtub in a completely different way than anyone can imagine. And that's the whole idea is you push the boundaries of photography. That's how you grow. And just like a cricket player or a basketball player or a soccer player need to practice every day, photographers, we need to practice every day. Are we going to have an argument? I can't wait. Let's do it. Uh, you know, making an image, very interesting. But... You keep citing Steve McCurry. Uh, I would like to discuss that and hear your views on Steve McCurry. Each and every image, uh, I would say 90% of his work, like monsoon, mean Indian Railways, is constructed. Yeah, I he, don't mean that. I don't mean that. When he I, has paid people yeah, yeah. to stand there and get themselves photographed. Right, I don't mean that. So that's another extent of actually making images. No. Yours you're, is you're, pure. You're, no, no, you're, yeah, exactly. Yours I, is pure. I don't mean, like, within the genre of you, like, if I want to make, a, take an image of you right now, I just pull up my camera and take it. Or do I want to not have your head in that man's crotch? He makes them stand, and he, they pose for him, and then he shoots his 500 rolls, and then he calls it documentary genre. In because lieu, he cited In Steve lieu of Wigner. burning any bridges, I remain no comment on that. <laughs> I don't mince words when it comes this to certain a, people. I have three answers. <laughs> yes. Okay. Hi. No. Maybe. <laughs> okay, hi. Uh, you just talked about that photograph where you saw men crying and it literally changed you in ways. My question is, I mean, your first assignment of covering war, were you mentally, already mentally prepared that you were going to cover a war so you have to make a emotional disconnect so that you don't end up feeling more than photographing? Or how much feeling does your photograph, how much feeling does matter in your photographs? Because you just, you just said that you pick up the camera mechanically and there's a disconnect automatically. And it is well, I think, I think it's, it's, it's different for everyone, like I'm. Did you um, deliberately try to disconnect, or it was just no? I think I'm usually disconnected from human beings. I'm slightly so sociopathic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also. Uh, no, I mean I, I I I grew up in New York when it was very violent. Um, I'd seen a lot of violence early in my life. Um, you know, my my dad used to beat me, and uh, I'd seen murder victims on the street. Like I, you know, like I had seen a lot of that growing up, so I kind of, maybe that sort of entered my psyche a little bit, but I, I knew I was ready. Condition. I'm not a woman. No, as I'm talking about myself. Yeah, okay. As a uh, woman, we are... <laughs> I <didn't laughs> as women, we are conditioned to think that if you're not feeling enough, if you're not emoting enough, you're not doing the right kind of job that a woman is supposed to do. Right. So that sort of... I've seen women photographers, women photojournalists not get war assignments, not go for war, war assignments because they're scared that they would end up feeling too much and they would end up doing what they are not supposed to do and what they're sent for. I am bad. I mean, it's not just women. It's not just women. It's like people have photographed they, are, and they've are committed they suicide because are, of how good they Are they, they not felt. getting the assignments or they're taking themselves out no, of the contention? They are themselves. They're too emotional, and um, I mean, that one part of the world you're being, you're being reinforced that you you're feeling you're emotional. I know people. Good. I know I know photographers who would say I could never cover war, because I w that that's not 
that's not something they would want to cover. And that goes a, a, across the genders. It's like I have male friends who are fashion photographers be like, I would, um, I would never do that. that. No, I'm just saying that it one in one part of the world, they're like, okay, you're a woman, you're supposed to be soft, delicate. And then they're also expected to do a lot of war coverage and all those supposedly man stuff. Well, so how I does mean, that balance out? I, I've never had that. Like, I, I find that the, the, the group of people who cover conflict, whether they're male or female, were all very similar in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never, I've never come across people who, like, were there to themselves out of contention because they didn't think they could do it. Um, you know, I think there's some things that people don't like to witness um, and who and make the choice not to witness it because one, it would give power to what they're seeing or two, they are not ready to see it. Um, you know, my wife did a, a movie on, uh, on FGM in Kenya on female genital mutilation and she made the choice that she didn't want to film an actual mutilation because she said, I, it's not that I don't want to see it, it's that I don't want to give that act power by having it in the movie. It's all about the choice. You it's, I think it's more about the choice. I mean, I yeah. have one, one point to add here. It, it's actually, when you said we woman, it's only the preconditioning the woman have, no, or, or probably it, it is the society that has put in into the mind, done that that way. They, they need to get out of that shell and say, yes, I am not that. I mean, we all have gender roles that have been assigned to us. Ben. Don't steal my thunder. <laughs> That's what I felt bad. <laughs> I'm having the women telling me, get up and speak. Shut your mouth and speak. Um, like Ben, I mean, I too have done a lot of war photography. I just don't talk about it because I'm more interested in my longer term projects. So I grew up very young, always as a tomboy. And I still feel very emotional about things I'm covering, but I'm professional. I'm not some weak little frail woman who like cries when I see somebody, you know. You're gonna be late to the panel because <laughs> I overslept. Shut up. You can't stereotype like that. That's very dangerous thinking. It's very dangerous even speaking that. It's very dangerous even believing that. You know, this country really needs to empower their women photographers, very much so. They need to empower women on a lot of levels in this country, but that's another story altogether. But I, I can't sit in this room honestly and have that sensibility that we're too fragile to cover these kinds of stories and not comment. It's, 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 I've met men who are too fragile to cover these kinds of things. I've met men who have said to me, how do you cover this stuff all the time? I would go nuts. Yeah, we do go nuts. We have a personal insanity living inside of us. He does, I do, all yeah, of us totally. who have covered this stuff for a long time. I go, I go back to my room and cry myself to sleep. He does. At night. He does. He does. That is exactly what I was trying to say. You need to come out of your shell to do that. And as a psychologist, I think the first thing that you should be doing is change your attitude. About it's not her. Oh, about it's, woman it's, itself. It's, it's, yeah. Ben, Ben, I, ben, I, just, I was just wondering. Does somebody have a hammer and a nail? Yeah. So we no. Uh, excuse me. I was wondering, uh, Aditya, Ben, I'm just wondering, yeah, whenever yeah. I go to Google and uh, search for the best photographers in the world, the best photographs are either covering poverty, war, oil spill, explosions, people dying in Uganda, yeah. or the war in Afghanistan. All these people, either they are on the streets covering poverty, and these people are considered with the top photographers today in the world. No, no, but, but that's what I'm wondering. No, but there is, there is no photographer, of course, apart from Assignment photographer. If he's a fashion photographer, he does fashion photography and all that. That's that's apart. All top photographers, they're going to war first. They've seen wars, destruction, tsunamis, explosions, all these negativity they're connecting, capturing in photography, and they are considered to be the top photographers of the world. And we are younger generation like me, you know, I'm also young in photography, not not in the age. But confused. Shall we shift? Shall there should be an, a, a war in India, or there should be a there should be an earthquake in India, so that I can go and cover no. and become famous? Let me no no. I, I, I actually have is, I have a very good answer I don't know whether you guys have noticed that. or not. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Journalism and news is news. 
is bad news. Listen, if there, there will never be a front page cover of a newspaper anywhere in the world, India, America, wherever, it says, little kid with a balloon, happy. <laughs> no, it'll be like little kid killed, popped balloon, blood everywhere. Because that is news. Like the normalcy of life, happiness, that for the most part is across the board. Everyone in the world, like 90% of the world, is like happy for most of their lives, except when they get blown up. And that's what makes newspapers. Like when, when a team wins India, Pakistan cricket, when you win, it's on the news. When you're not playing, it's not on the news. Right? So news are events that happen. Streets of that war. Okay, Nick Ut. That, that become a, a, a marvelous picture for two decades, three decades. We have grown. Probably the Syrian boy on the beach may become the same thing for coming three decades. So right. these are the pictures which are going to the photography and photographers should go to that kind of photography. I mean, Maholanagi, uh, Cartier-Bresson, all these people, but, they, they, also in this they didn't, but they didn't do war, right? Those pictures stand the test of time. Like, you know, there's photographs that are used and photographs that are seen and photographs that are going to be seen in 100 years. There's also, like, a cornucopia of photographers now and images that there never were before. Like, if you think in the last year, more pictures were taken in the last year than in all the other years of photography's existence combined. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of images. But, but the thing is, like, d war for journalism is a great way to start a career, 100%. You go to war as a young journalist, it's, it, it jump starts your career. I, I can testify to that because it jump started my career. I do other things now. Um, but that doesn't say that like that's the only viable alternative. I have plenty of friends who do other things and who are just as big in their genre who do photojournalism. Matt Eich, who is a, a young father of two little girls and he's an amazing photojournalist. He hardly ever leaves the little town that he lives in and just documents what's in front of him. And he gets grants up the kazoo. Like there, I, I don't, War is there, and you'll see it, and we award people who are, we, you know, it, I think are like gallivanting action stars in this way. Like, why do we like action movies and go to action movies and, you know, people who live life on their edge? War photographers are sort of like this weird debonair thing. Like, oh, they've been to a foreign land, and they're like soldiers, and, you know, like, wow. I mean, there's, there's some worth we put on that. But that, that, that's not the only thing. Uh, you know, I, and I, I, I just think that when you, when you Google greatest photographers ever, I don't think that just war photography comes up. I think you'll have, like, some Ansel stuff. I think you'll have Cartier-Bresson. You might have Martin Parr. For God's sakes, Martin Parr. I mean, really? But, like, the, you know, there's, there's worth in all of that. Like, I love street photography. Gary Winogrand. Or, you know, even what this, the, the collective That's Life is doing. Like, y there's all kinds of amazing stuff that has nothing to do with war that has to do about the human condition. And I think those will stand the test of time one way or another. No, but people grow up wanting to be Joel Meyerowitz and Gary Winogrand. A hundred percent. There are plenty of people who don't want to be war photographers, yeah. who just want to do, who, d who want to be Gary Winogrand. Yeah, you get to wear a scarf and wear body armor, and it's a great way to pick. And do you feel that you were exploited? No, not at all. Um, embedding is a term for being with the group you're photographing. So if I went Ox and then went to have tea with them afterwards, went to their homes, which I totally did, I was embedded with them. If I'm doing a story on Afghan drug addicts, I'm embedded with them. It's, it's just a terminology that says you're with this group. You have to be with a group when you're photographing them. You have to be intimate with them. I didn't, I saw soldiers do things that were wrong and I photographed it. I saw torture and I photographed it. And it, 
didn't, I wasn't part of any propaganda machine. What I was part of was the only way to get information out. It's not like Al Qaeda in Iraq would let me photograph them. Be like, hey guys, can I come photograph you? No, I'd die. Okay, embedding is just a term to say you're with this group of people. And no, I totally do not feel that I played propaganda in any way. I think most of my images are are not, you know, pro American government or American war policy. In fact, they're pretty anti. Um, I think embedding was the only way to get access safely as a white Westerner to cover that war. After Daniel Pearl was killed, I mean, there was, it was, you know, it was a us versus them, it was East versus West. They, in 2005, American soldiers found a PowerPoint presentation for sniper, Al Qaeda snipers in Iraq. And they said the first target should be uh, an officer and the second target should be embedded media because the government would not be able to deny that an embedded journalist had been killed we're just as much a target. So the only way to effectively cover a story that will affect my children, like the outcome, what happened, the Iraq war, and everything that it's done, including the Arab Spring and what's happening in Syria, this is gonna affect my kids. So the only way to effectively cover the beginning of that story was to do an embed. It's the safest way to do it. The statement I don't agree at all, like everyone over here, I mean the photographers actually dreamt about being war photographer. We particularly are like, we, we pursue street photography as a, as a medium, and particularly th you also mentioned that that's yeah. life thing. We believe we are documenting in our, in our own way our society, and there's nothing we want to l show any conflict or distractions. That's fine. So it's, it's the normal daily life we are shooting. Yeah, and, I agree. And in any way, we were nowhere less than any war photographer in our own I, journey. I 100% agree with you. 100 years from now, yes, what do you dead. want to be remembered for? Your what? war pictures or your p pictures on something which is positive. A hundred years from now, what do I want to be known for? Yeah, what do you call Henry Katya Brazong or uh, if uh, you want to be remembered, what do you want to be remembered for? A really awesome father. I, I, I would love for one of my images, whatever they are, to be in, you know, a textbook for students somewhere that teaches them something about what went on. <laughs> Whether it's war or, you know. Um. Now I understand there's no news, like bad news, uh, but where do you draw the line between effectively informing the public around the world and having that threat of desensitizing them? Now a quick follow up to that. Um, they say that you undermine the humanity of uh, your enemy so as to justify the inhuman things that you do, mm -hmm. do to them. Um, and that's pertinent in journalism because Overemphasis on say articles about oh Gaddafi rapes children so uh, let's go after him he's a bad guy right show him in that light so as to justify what you're totally. going to do to him um, as an American um, shooting two wars where Americans are supposedly on the right side of thing in terms of geopolitics um, subconsciously was it difficult for you to draw that line between um, what will desensitize because if you are shooting a very graphic picture of a fallen American soldier. Um, maybe that's not desensitizing, maybe that will work better with the domestic populace at home. Uh, and for, because you're an American yourself, that right. would be fallen brethren, but an Arab uh, with his brains blown out, that's too graphic, so let's not show okay. it. Well, I mean, there's a twofold in society that are educated and have access to TVs and movies are desensitized from violence. Like, how many action movies do we watch where, you know, how many murders are there on TV shows. Like even when I, like my kid, my eldest son is six years old and he starts watching cartoons and the cartoons today have people dying in them. And like even when I was little and watched G.I. Joe, no one ever died. Like the A-Team, when we were younger, like no one ever died in those shows. Now they die all the time. So if you want to talk about desensitized, you, you have Call of Duty video games which are so realistic where you can kill people. My uh,